Thanks so much, Ursula, for um, organizing this and for giving me a chance to talk to all of you. Welcome. Um, I wish we could have done it, done this in person, but we live in strange times. Um, so as I was telling Ursula before you came in, I had initially written this talk to be about my research, which is um, about cosmology. Cosmology is the science that uses physics and maths to try to study the history of our universe. But two days ago, um, I was in a racism and equality discussion group with uh, my colleagues in, in Cambridge. And as we, at, in the course of that discussion, I realized that we focus a lot on the science we do and not so much about the people doing the science. Actually, I think we lose a lot in terms of the humanity of the scientist itself. So given that in mind, and I don't really want to be a part of that problem, so I decided that I'm going to change my talk a little bit, and I'm going to use some of my time to talk about uh, the problems that we face in how we see science and how we see the role of the scientist. Um, I'll pause and I'll open the floor to discussions because I'm sure all of you have a lot of thoughts about this. And then um, I'm going to talk a little less about cosmology than I had originally planned. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about the work that I actually do. So uh, to start with, I'm going to ask you all a question. What does a mathematician look like? The first image that comes to your mind, um, if you can write it up in the chat, if you don't, no pressure, if you don't want to, that's fine. Um, during the question time, um, I'll, I'll, Ursula or I will have a look uh, at your answers. So, I mean, I'm ashamed to admit this, but um, to me, when I think of what a mathematician looks like, the image that comes to my brain is this one. Actually, uh, this is an image I got of the internet where I Googled mathematician and Google images uh, gave me a result where I would say 98% and more of the images look like this one. So when I was growing up and I was a teenager and I decided that I wanted to be a cosmologist, all of the examples that I had in front of me looked like this picture. Um, so I guess my expectation was that I would one day look like this picture. Unfortunately, the reality more, looks more like this one. That's also kind of the attitude I have when I see pictures like this about how mathematicians look like or physicists look like. This is real life and that's usually how I feel. And it honestly, it's really disappointing. So um, this is actually the reality. And um, it's kind of sad that the only image that we see of a scientist or a mathematician is the picture I showed you. So I'm gonna ask the question is why do we see mathematicians as lone white men working in isolation? Um, to me, a, a prime example of this is Andrew Wiles. I don't know if you guys have heard of, the, of him. Um, he's, he's a really, really famous mathematician. I think he's most famous for solving um, or proving um, Fermat's last theorem, and there's a documentary about him. One of the key things I remember about this story is that he worked for seven years in secrecy in his attic alone. And um, for me, I know you don't know me very well, but I'm not someone who likes working alone. I like people. Lockdown has been really hard because I haven't been able to see my uh, colleagues and friends. And honestly, when I talk to people and we talk not just about maths and physics, but just in general, um, it gives me the energy to do better maths and physics. And if you like working alone or in isolation, that's not a problem at all. I'm totally supportive of what you want to do. All I'm saying is that we should allow the image of what a mathematician or a physicist is be wider, that there are many ways to do maths, physics, and science in general. And honestly, this sort of pressure of this, this idea of isolation and suffering for our science is contributing to a whole wide range of mental health issues, which I think uh, the image that we put out is alienating people good people who would be able to do really, really good work from entering the field. And I think this is a problem. And this contributes to many other issues, some of which I will try to highlight in the next few slides. So this is a statistic that if you enter the field, it's, it's a rather depressing picture that um, you will perhaps see over and over again being placed in front of you. 
This picture gives you the percentage of senior lectureship positions occupied by women in science um, in, in Europe. As I say, this, this picture is frankly disheartening. And the conversation of why we have so few women in science has been a long one and something that I have come of age in. Um, the reason I started doing science was when was because when in Kolkata growing up, I was 13 and um, there was an outreach effort internationally and um, a cosmologist from uh, UCLA um, came to my school to talk to students and to encourage more women to join astrophysics and cosmology. Well, I guess one case was successful. Um, but, you know, the conversation around women in science have, and like trying to solve the problem of why there are so few women, um, have, has resol revolved around things like, oh, we need better representation. We need to have more positions that are targeted only towards women. We need to uh, have more female role models in the field. We need to have better access to childcare. We need better access to maternity and paternity leave we need better pay, all of these things. And I think all of these things are really, really important to try to minimize the gender gap. But I think the problem, when we focus on these things, we, we neglect the problem at its heart. And to me, the problem is the way we think about women and other minorities. The problem when we say that we need more fellowships to target women, sometimes I have heard this being interpreted as, we need to give people who are not meritorious enough a chance just because they're women. And I think this is a terrible thing to say because not only is it false, but also because this again contributes to this idea that science is this objective meritocratic elitist institution. The academ academia is a science, is this elitist meritocratic institution, which only those with a certain skill set, socioeconomic background, racial or gender background can access. And I think this is so harmful and is contributing to the problem. Let's look at um, the racial uh, statistics, right? Um, again, not great. Uh, the, the percentage of black women uh, with bachelor's degrees in science is shockingly low. And as you see, it has actually become lower. I'll tell you a story. So um, a few years ago, I was um, in Columbia University in New York. I was attending a conference in general relativity. And it was a, my first major international conference. And um, I was really excited because I was going to meet a lot of people whose papers I had only read. And I had this moment inside the room where this conference was taking place. It's, it's the largest international conference in general relativity. So people flew in from all around the world, let me know. So I was sitting in this room and I had this moment where I looked around the room and realized that I was the only person of color present. This was, this was shocking to me. And it, and it took me the realization that when I stepped out of the room onto the street in New York City, I saw so much diversity, so many people of all colors, genders, ethnicities, backgrounds, but somehow inside that conference room, that reality was not represented. And this is something that I think that I've faced throughout my life. And again, the conversations around race are slightly different, but often follow similar patterns about of around conversations of gender, better gender representation in um, astronomy and in STEM in general. Do we need more targeted fellowships, etc.? What about um, uh, marginalized gender identities and sexualities. I honestly looked for statistics on LGBT plus qu and queer people. I understand that making statistics where you force people to come out is problematic. But when I googled uh, queer people in physics, the uh, search results I got were around harassment. How many queer people are harassed? How many queer people are assaulted in physics? How many disabled people face discrimination? There were no, I couldn't really, I had to dig honestly to find positive stories of people who had owned their queer identity and were doing what they were passionate about. Somehow the discourse around queerness and uh, disabled people focuses on assault, on harassment, on discrimination. And honestly, this kind of dis discourse centered around uh, people of color and women or both um, maybe 10, 10 years ago or even less. 
So the fact that we all as a scientific community look at these marginalized identities as being endangered somehow, that they are all they are all cases that we need to extend charity to, which is sort of the discourse that was around race a few days ago when I was talking about it, I think is highly problematic because it ignores a lot of the histories of how science has become the institution that we know it to be today. I don't know if many of you are familiar with the decolonized education movement, especially the decolonizing science movement, but essentially the, the crux of the matter is that science as an institution in the way we know of it today has been built on the backs of colonial identities, on the backs of black and brown people who have been used as test subjects to further scientific results, which have then been used to further imperialism. And that sort of attitude exists even today. When we look at the science that is being done in the West as somehow being intellectually superior to, being, to the science that is done in non-Western contexts. There is so much discrimination in the way collaborations are done, in the way authorships and credits are given to, to people who are from marginalized identities. And so if we're actually, um, we're actually committed to increasing representation and making our scientific institution more representative of the world that we live in, then I think we need to really start interrogating what science means to us and who does science. So with this regard, I think we need climate change. It's a controversial statement, but I don't think I, I'm talking about climate change in the way you may have heard of it. What I'm asking for is that we need a change in the climate of academia. We need to stop it from being presented as this elitist hierarchical institution where only a very sh small minority of people have access to it. And for that, I think I'm going to be calling for more inclusivity. I think we need to be accountable for what has contributed to this extremely narrow representation in science. It's not a coincidence. It's not because white straight men are better than the rest of us or they're smarter. That's not it at all. They've, we've just created an environment that is so inhospitable to anybody except for that particular demographic that we that our biases are so deep rooted that we can't even think of an alternative future. I'm gonna be asking for collaboration and I don't mean these large scientific collaborations would still perpetuate these social injustices that, that occur every day. What I mean is a collaborative spirit where we are not constantly competing with each other to uh, get the next paper out or win the next prize or get a scientific result out before others. I'm going to be asking for a bit of humility. Honestly, as scientists, we think we're better than society. We're not. We're part of society and nothing exists outside of a social framework or canvas. We just can't escape it and it's time we were accountable and we um, accepted that that's the case. And finally, I'm asking for a bit of empathy. This, um, I know that this is a difficult conversation to have. Um, it's not easy talking to somebody who's had access to privileges that I didn't and to ask them to be accountable for those privileges. And I'm trying to be empathetic and I think the empathy, empathy has to run both ways. At the end of the day, we're all here for the same thing. We're all here to do what at least I am very, very passionate about. The science I do makes my life meaningful. So we don't need to make this harder than it already is. And if we can just sort of try to find a way to work together, then maybe we can make science not look, the scientific academic not look so scary from the outside. This is a tall ask. And I think I have to caveat this with one final point. It's okay to love yourself and your values more than you love science. That the, I really hope that not, not necessarily after this talk, but in the course of your lives, some of you will at least uh, find the joy that I have found in doing physics and maths and want to pursue it. But if, but the environment as it is, is actually really inhospitable. I'm not, I can't lie to you about that. It, the fight for me is still meaningful because as I say, uh, the work I do gives meaning to my life. But I want you to know that 
if you are passionate about science, I want you to do science for the right reasons. Not because you have this entirety of this weight of changing an institution on your heads, or you feel pressured into it because of some uh, something you read on the internet or somebody somebody to, some something somebody told you to do. It's okay for you to fall out of love with science at any point in your careers and try to do and want to do something else. It's okay for you to pursue it as far and as long as you want to pursue it. And I really hope that you will find people who are mentors who will support you in that regard and will not judge you for any decisions that you make for whatever reasons you want to make them for. So with this, I think this is a good place to stop and um, I'll take some questions. Hello. Hi. Uh, I have a question. So you've been saying that uh, science makes, like gives meaning to your life, right? Yes. I think this is a very poetic sentence to say, but can you give it more like realistic meaning? Like, can you, can you explain it in a more realistic life words meaning? Okay, um, so throughout my life, um, whenever I've had issues uh, with, you know, life stuff, whether family stuff, friends, or, you know, I struggle with depression quite a lot on and off. Um, in those moments, I have found um, connecting with other people really difficult, and I felt quite lost. Um, from the beginning, so I think from when I was 10 or 12 years old, um, when I sit down with a math problem or uh, a problem where I can where I can lose where I can sort of focus on trying to figure figure out the answer, everything becomes simpler, and all of the other chaos that might occur in my life, it somehow becomes less important because life sometimes seems impossible to me me, and then the work that I do, it gives me some solace and some comfort, and um, it somehow makes the pain more manageable and I'm able to lose myself and find joy in it. And I think for me, the fact that I can travel to, well, I don't mean travel in the literal sense, but I mean that internally I can travel and learn things that I hadn't possibly known the day before. That gives me more joy than anything uh, I have ever experienced in my life. So that's why it gives me meaning. So you're saying that in more psychological words, you've been escaping from life problems by going into science. Sometimes I think it's necessary because um, there is a proverb, uh, I think, I, I think it's an old Nigerian proverb, which says that muddy water is best cleared when it's left to lie. And allowing muddy water to lie can sometimes be really difficult. And maybe other people have the psychological strength to just sit with it. But for me, doing science or doing physics and maths allows me to access that stillness. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Any more questions? If there is no other questions, I have another question. So okay. I will be waiting till the others say anything. <laughs> okay. Um, and Nora, I don't know if that's your name, but please go yeah, ahead. That's my name. <laughs> yeah, that's name. Okay, so can I go on? Yeah, please. Okay, so you've been talking about uh, the image of men, of white men, especially working in isolation, uh, mathematicians, uh, like in different, in different kinds of sciences, surgeons, uh, doctors, physicians, like every single thing that has to do with science, it's a white man working in isolation. Um, I don't think that's necessarily true. I was speaking more of mathematics and theoretical physics because that's the field that I am in. And that sort of uh, the image that I, sorry. Like for me as a student, it's been also my, like I'm a student who wants to, do, to be a doctor one day. And uh, I've been thinking, like when you said, when you like g gave us the, the question, 
I was like imagining the same thing for a doctor and a surgeon is a white man working in isolation or at least working by himself as a leader. Yeah. And don't you think that it has so much to do with the history starting from Galileo Galilei and how it, it, like the history described him? Yeah, I mean, um, I think uh, this is what I meant by accountability that uh, we have to be accountable as to why um, the scientific institution projects this sort of image of, of isolation, of suffering, of whiteness, of maleness as being intrinsically linked with science. It's not because other people didn't do science or there were, there were not other ways of doing science. It's because for some, for a reason, not some reason, I know very well what the reason <laughs> is, um, the, the dominant narrative became patriarchal, colonial, white, heteronormative, all of these things. The reason is a violent reason. And I think that that accountability is not present enough in any of the conversations that I'm a part of. And I, I'm, I'm going to talk about it till the cows come home. I'm going to keep saying it until people start, uh, this becomes more mainstream. Um, I mean, you, we keep talking, you keep saying these things, you keep like science people and people with knowledge, they keep like giving head titles and subtitles and uh, trying to tell the, the people with, with less knowledge about it and to make it more clear and make it more obvious. But it's still the same, no matter how much people talk, no matter how uh, conferences are made, no matter how you are trying, it, it's not changing what what do you think is going to 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 make it change yeah i i hear you um honestly i'm i don't know you but i'll i'll tell you this the last two days have been really difficult because of this conversation that i had with my colleagues about this and this has reinforced uh the problem that you're saying that i feel frustrated i feel like we've been here for hundreds of years and nothing has changed um the, uh, the direct answer is that I wish I knew. I don't. I have some ideas. Um, I think that just having conversations is not going to cut it anymore. Because as you say, we have had confer conversations, conferences, and so on. Yeah. I know that now, um, in this current climate, with the Black Lives Matter protests, people are suddenly talking about race. And it feels a little bit insulting to me, too, because the problem has been around for so long. And now suddenly it's, it feels performative. Um, I, but, I agree as well. And yeah. uh, it's true, we could go, go on talking about this. And uh, I'm sure that uh, not all people are like uh, the ones you are, have been talking to. And it's very interesting. And we need, just, just to, be, to be fair and inclusive of everybody, there's great mathematicians everywhere. By the way, uh, I'm not sure science uh, started with Galileo Galilei. I'm Italian, I love Galileo, but uh, there's lots of science before that. Um, OK, so, um, so let's just move on to the bit about um, what I actually do on a regular basis. So um, I'm actually going to give you a bit of an origin story today. Um, the origin story that um, I'm going to give you is uh, that of our universe. So to begin with, uh, let's, let me give you a bit of an outline of how we're gonna go through this. The first question I'm going to ask you is, um, where did we all come from? And uh, then I'm going to present uh, two separate models of uh, the very early universe. I work on both, uh, one more than the other. And then I'm going to try to give you a bit of a flavor for um, model building in cosmology and how we end up doing this. So I don't want to be rude. I know I've talked a little bit about myself, but um, I'm going to tell you where I came from. So I'm from India. I come from a city called Kolkata um, in West Bengal. I did my PhD at the University of Cambridge, which is where I study. And I spent a brief amount of time in Dartmouth College in the US uh, where I did my fellowship. Now, you've come, got to know me a little bit, but the reason I told you about this is because I want to impress upon you that the question of origins, where things came from, is actually a fundamental question. When you meet someone for the first time, you probably ask them where they came from, though I know this can be a controversial question in many senses. 
So the question that I am interested in is where did we all come from? And this picture that I'm showing you is a picture of um, the universe when it was really, really young. It's called something, it's called um, the cosmic microwave background radiation. And this radiation is a low hum that um, surrounds the universe today um, at a very low temperature. And it's basically the radiation or the light that's left over from the very energetic event that occurred uh, to create the universe that we live in today. And the patterns in the temperature of the light gives us clues of what that event could have been and what the history of our universe was in the intervening time. So you can see that this picture is uh, colored differently. So the different colors correspond to the temperature of the light that we are able to see today. Um, so there are some properties that we uh, know about this uh, cosmic microwave background radiation. And the first property is that it follows a very familiar pattern, a very familiar spectrum, which is called a black body spectrum. Now black body spectrum, you can sort of understand as uh, a body that is perfectly absorptive and perf perfectly radiative. Um, so because we know what the pattern of this black body spectrum is, we're able to immediately read off the overall temperature of this microwave background. So it's about three Kelvin. So it's really, really cold. Now the light that is free streaming to us, it was not always able to stream so freely. This is because when the universe started, um, it was it was made up of molecules that, or it was made up of normal particles. When I say normal, I mean the particles that make up you and me and everything that you can see around us. By the way, the, this sort of matter is in a strict minority if you look at the, uh, the composition of the universe. Um, so these, these matter particles, which I will call baryonic matter, was very tightly coupled. It was interacting. All of these particles were charged and they were talking to each other. And the photons, which are the particles that make up light, were kind of trapped in these interactions. Now the universe is expanding. It expanded in the past. It's still expanding. Um, it got bigger. And as it got bigger, it got cooler. So these charged particles that were interacting and talking to each other were kind of drawn further away from each other. And so the interactions became less tight and less, less tightly coupled. And so the photons were able to stream towards us. And this is what we call the surface of last scattering. And this is the, the surface of which we are receiving information from in looking at the cosmic microwave background. So if you, if you look at the picture, you can see that um, if I made the picture black and white and you couldn't see the colors, it would look about the same whichever direction you looked at it in. This property is called isotropy. But it's not exactly the same, right? There are a few variations. And these variations are important because they give us information of how the photons had bounced off all these charged particles that it was interacting with at the surface of last scatter, and also how the photons interacted with charged particles as it streamed towards us. So when the photons started streaming, to give you an idea, um, the universe from this energetic event, whatever it was, was about 300,000 years old, and it was at a temperature of uh, about 3,000 Kelvin at the surface of last scatter. Cut to today, 14 billion years later, and the photons are at 3 Kelvin. So there was significant energy loss and significant cooling. Because all the photons scattered at different points of time and, with different, and lost different amounts of energy, these are at different temperatures because the more energy you have, the hotter you are, the hotter the, temp the photon is. And so uh, these temperature variations would give us an idea of the structures that uh, populated the universe in the middle of between last scattering and now. Bear in mind that the cosmic microwave background is a 2D map. So now we've gotten a bit cleverer and we're looking at the distribution of galaxies in the universe, and we are looking at the large scale structure to gain similar information, but of course we're looking at it in three dimensions. So we get a lot more information from looking at the distribution of large scale structure. 
The other thing that's super interesting about the CMB is that uh, CMB is a short, an acronym for Cosmic Microwave Background, is that uh, very disparate ends of the sky, which were, are really, really far away from each other, seem to have really small variations in temperature between them. Small as in the temperature variation is one in 10 to the power of five, it was in one part in 10 to the power of five. The problem uh, with standard Big Bang cosmology is that if you extrapolate this backwards, you will find that these bits of the sky that are, are so far away from each other that they could never have been in contact with each other in the distant past. So it appears to be kind of a big coincidence that parts of the sky that are so far away from each other, far enough that they could never have been interacting with each other in the past, could have such small variations of temperature in between them. This, in summary, is what is called the horizon problem. Um, so any theory of the early universe that uh, we, I, myself, and people who work in early universe cosmology construct has to sort of explain the patterns of these, the temperature of these photons in the cosmic microwave background, the patterns of how galaxies are distributed in the universe, why so things that are really far apart from each other have such small variations between them, basically why the universe looks the way it is. And so with, this is sort of the thinking that led people to try to construct different models of the very early universe to try to see what could be um, the, a possible model the one model that could be that could explain all of the things that I just mentioned. By the way, uh, a big hope that we have is that if we come up with a consistent model of the very early universe, then we will also be able to explain the late time universe. And the biggest issue of the late time universe that we have is that the universe seems to be getting bigger faster. What I mean by this is that the universe is expanding in an accelerated way. And the reason it seems to be expanded in an accelerated way could be due to something called dark energy. It's dark because we don't know anything about it. Uh, we don't know how to construct any kinds of field theories about it. And the hope is that if we come up with a consistent model of the early universe, it'll give some clues to us as what the dark, what this dark energy really is. And it's actually pretty important, not just because the universe is expanding in an accelerated way, but also because this dark energy makes up about 70% of what the universe um, is made of. So it's kind of major. But anyway, I wanna tell you today about two paradigms. They're not two models, they're actually paradigms. So excuse the misnomer um, of how uh, we think of the very early universe. The first paradigm is called inflation. And I'm trying to move. So this infographic is something that um, if you continue in cosmology, you will see shown to you various times. So on the far left of this diagram, you have the energetic event that we have come to know as the Big Bang. And then you have a period which is called inflation. The rest of the diagram talks about um, the, the history of the universe that we are more familiar with. Other than dark energy domination, I would say that uh, the broad strokes, the broad brush strokes picture of the universe um, is quite familiar to us and fits kind of neatly within what we call the standard model of cosmology. I work at the very extreme left of the picture. So just to give you an idea of how minute uh, the time frame that I'm interested in really is. Um, so what is cosmological inflation? So cosmological inflation hypothesizes a period in the history of our universe but the universe got really big really quickly. So it expanded in an accelerated way, kind of like what it's doing now. And the good thing about uh, this period of cosmological inflation is that it very easily solves problems like, why is the universe looking the same whichever direction we look at it in? Or why does the universe look kind of homogenous? Spoiler, it is not homogenous, but we like to assume that it is. Um, whichever direct, which from patch to patch that we look at it in. Um, what is the distribution of temperatures in the photons in the CMB? And cosmological inflation actually, to a certain degree, is able to explain certain parameters that allow us to quantify 
these patterns and the temperature differences in the CMB. However, it suffers from certain problems. So inflation is a paradigm. It is a model that we have to figure out where this model came from. And the higher energy realization, the broad picture where this model fits into our understanding of uh, physics and space and time, it hasn't quite worked out. And as time goes on, we find more and more problems with putting this, this picture of inflation in a bigger picture understanding of space and time. The problem that I am most interested in is, however, the idea that if you had a universe that was expanding really, really quickly, you couldn't but end up, when you thought of what the universe would do if you went back in the past, end up in something called a cosmological singularity. To me, this is a problem. So when I first started studying about cosmology, I asked what happened at the Big Bang and what happened before the Big Bang. And I was always shushed and shushed and told, you know, you can't ask these questions because it doesn't make sense. Now, the reason it doesn't make sense is the precise point that a cosmology or a universe that is getting bigger throughout its history cannot avoid a singularity in its distant past. And a singularity is something we don't like to talk about is because we're embarrassed because we don't really know how to characterize a singularity within uh, the theories that we have at our disposal, such as general relativity. One of the things that we say is that, well, maybe when we are able to put general relativity in this bigger picture that I keep talking about, and this bigger picture is quantum gravity, then maybe we can sort, sort of resolve the singularity problem. But I decided that I want to take a little bit of a different route. When I say I, actually this idea has been sort of pushed around in the community from quite a while ago, but has been experiencing a resurgence in recent times. My motivation for studying an alternative model for the early universe is that I don't like an idea of a history of the universe which is incomplete. And the presence of a singularity necessarily makes our history or what we understand the history of the universe to be incomplete. So the alternative that I am studying and I'm proposing to all of you is the alternative of a big bounce. So what do we mean by a big bounce? So this means the picture that I'm thinking of is that I'm going to ask the question of what happened before the Big Bang. And I'm saying that the universe would have gotten smaller and it got and it contracts and gets smaller to a certain point. And it reaches a minimum size, which we call a bounce. This size is finite. So the evolution of the universe is not singular at any point. Once it reaches this finite size, there are some new physics, which I am, I am hypothesizing and working on, which allows the universe to then re-expand. And when it re-expands, it goes into the history that we're all very familiar with. Now, this new physics that causes this re-expansion is something that would leave signatures, I think. And these signatures are things that we would be able to see in the cosmic microwave background or in the large-scale structure. And it is these distinguishing signatures between whether there was this bounce or there was some form of a singular event and then there was expansion forever is what will allow us to distinguish between these two paradigms. In this scenario of the bounce, what we know as the Big Bang, this energetic event, will actually be the, be the bounce. And these new physics that we inject either for inflation or for the bounce, this should leave discerning characteristics in the observations that we do in the universe today, which will allow us to distinguish between these two scenarios. I realize that I've uh, thrown quite a lot at you already. So I'm gonna take a pause and I'm going to try to uh, summarize what I've said so far. And to summarize, I'm going to use a quote by uh, a writer that I don't know if you're familiar with called Douglas Adams. Uh, if you haven't read the trilogy in four parts of the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, I highly recommend it. But he writes at the restaurant at the end of the universe, the story so far. In the beginning, the universe was created. This has made a lot of people very angry and been widely regarded as a bad move. Kind of the story of my life in cosmology conferences where we argue about whether inflation is, is, is to be included within the standard model of cosmology. But jokes aside, let me quickly actually uh, recap what I have just said. I have said that cosmology is a science that uses maths and physics to try to understand the history of the universe. 
we look at the observations of the current day universe. And the places that we can look for these observations are in the cosmic microwave background, which is a radiation left over from the energetic event that could have been the Big Bang. Um, and we look at this radiation and patterns in the distribution of its temperature and in the large scale structure of the distribution of galaxies to find patterns. And, to un and we understand that these patterns are the way they were because the universe has evolved in a particular way. We model what the uh, beginning of the universe was and we model it to solve problems such as the horizon problem. Why are two very far apart parts of the universe so similar? Or, and we try to so, uh, explain the patterns that we see in the cosmic microwave background and in the large scale structure of the universe. So one such model of the early universe is inflation where there was an energetic event such as the Big Bang and then the universe got bigger faster. It accelerated in expansion. This is a good model, explains some patterns, is able to explain why the universe is so similar uh, on very large scales, but has many issues such as an embedding in a high energy theory of quantum gravity, and also has the issue that concerns me the most, that is that a Big Bang singularity is ubiquitous. We can't avoid it if we end up thinking of a universe that has expanded forever. So I'm uh, talking about an alternative which says that maybe if we didn't have a singularity, maybe what we see as the Big Bang is a big bounce, and that before the big bounce, the universe contracted injected some new physics of this big bounce, and then re-expanded. And I'm saying also that the diagnostics that we have today in terms of the large scale structure and the cosmic microwave background will allow us to distinguish between the kind of physics we need to make a bounce happen versus the kind of physics we need to make inflation happen in these two disparate paradigms. And the last section that I want to uh, leave you with is a little bit of a primer in model building and cosmology is what I actually do on an everyday basis. So all of these things might sound really abstract as to how our universe is bouncing or expanding. And the way I am talking about it is, as, is coming from the fact that I have at my disposal a really powerful toolkit. And this toolkit or this way of understanding the universe and gravity is general relativity. And this toolkit basically tells us, hypothesized by Einstein, that space tells matter how to move and matter tells space how to curve. What I mean by this is that, the, that in the theory of general relativity, we no longer think of gravity as a force. We think of it as being manifested as a geometry of space time. And the geometry of space-time will tell the things that exist in a space-time, you, me, planets, black holes, how to move over this geometry. But because we have mass, we gravitate. And if we gravitate, we influence the way the geometry of the space-time will manifest. So matter, geometry, these are inexorably linked. They are one and the same thing, and we cannot think of them separately. So when I want my geometry to do something interesting, such as bounce, expand, whatever have you, I, as a theorist, a modeler, I will have to adjust the matter part of this equation. By introducing certain kinds of matter, I can introduce certain behaviors in the geometry of space-time. And this is what I mean by new physics. Introducing these new kinds of matter comes at a cost. And the cost is that there will be certain observational signatures that should or should not be present. If they're not present, then you know my model isn't correct. It was a great model, but I have to throw it out. And that is exactly where we go to in finding these new kinds of exotic matter. So the place that we go to is Toys R Us. I'm kidding. The Toys R Us are actually for us string theory. So string theory gives us a large selection of different kinds of ingredients that we can use to model the kinds of matter that could have been present in the very early universe. There's a particular kind of ingredient that theoretical cosmologists absolutely adore, and they're called scalar fields. And scalar fields are the things that drive inflation, that drive bounces. And they have really special properties that we can model and then look for signatures of these properties in the late universe. Now, these scalar fields are not completely abstract and exotic, as you might think. 
you in fact know of perhaps an example of a scalar field. And such an example um, is the Higgs field. The Higgs field you may have heard of in connection to the Large Hadron Collider because um, with the discovery of the Higgs particle. People have tried to use the Higgs field as a real example of modeling early universe scenarios with varying degrees of success. And their hope is that either by building new colliders at higher energies, for example, the future circular collider, or by looking at astroparticle physics, looking at signatures that is left over from these models that we build and we put these scalar fields in, we're able to gain a window into what the particular particle content of our universe is. So this actually is ties into what I mean with early universe cosmology modeling, and also what I mean in by using the universe as our collider, that we can look for observational signatures to give us clues as to what kind of particles make up everything that we see around us. And with that, I'm gonna take some questions for this section of the talk. Can you derive the formula, please? Sorry? Can you derive the formula you just showed us? Where did it come from? Um, which formula? Do you mean the, uh, this yeah, one? Yeah, that one, that one. So um, deriving, I think it comes from a theory. So Einstein basically uh, studied um, the geometry, he studied uh, Riemannian geometry, and then he hypothesized, he did this thought experiment where he realized that um, when you think of the way observ observers behave under a gravitational field, you can end up thinking of it exactly the way uh, observers or objects move on Riemannian surfaces, which we call manifolds. And in fact, you can uh, establish an exact one-to-one -one correspondence between the two. So uh, given this idea, he was able to work out a self-consistent mathematical description of this model. And in the end, after 12 years, he ended up with this equation. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I mean, that's sorry to chip in because uh, of course you're familiar every day with that equation but our participants will will not and yes. that is the main equation of of general relativity isn't that correct it's not my field but uh, yeah i mean this is this is general relativity exactly. i've just shown you this equation i mean actually it might it might uh, uh, be deceptively simple this equation is actually 12 equations and they're all coupled and uh, Einstein found a really f uh, clever shorthand of writing these 12 equations in the form of one equation by using these uh, indices. So the mu and the nu letters that you see, they actually encode several other quantities. For general relativity in four dimensions, each of these indices run from zero to three. I mean, the reason why we pick out zero as a special index is the time index, because it behaves differently to space, because you can go backwards and forwards on an X and Y axis, but going backwards and forwards in time is a little bit more involved. I would say that it's not quite the same thing. Hey, it's Noor again. Yes, uh, <laughs> so you've been saying that the world is expanding in an accelerating way. And when that happened in the past, it led to the beginning of the world. So that means it, we are going toward the end of the world. Interesting question. Um, if uh, we have a domination of dark energy, then we end up in an expansion singularity. What I mean is that we end up with infinite expansion where things have been pulled so far apart from each other that there is no energy left for doing any meaningful work. So we will end up in sort of a heat death where everything is chaotic and entropic actually. And there is no more energy of left available for work, for, uh, for creating new processes. Um, so yeah, in that sense, it's an end of the world there. If, if we, so this is what I meant by when I said that, uh, it, the future of our universe will depend upon what the past is because, um, depending on how we are, if we are modeling our early universe and what kind of signatures we get, that early universe model will have connotations for whether, you know, the universe is going to expand forever and end up in a future expansion singularity, whether the universe is going to recollapse and end up in like a crunch singularity or what have you, you know? So it's really important for us to figure out what happened in the very beginning. But do you still not have enough information about dark energy? 
like no. as sign actually we don't so when we try to uh, we do actually, i'm embarrassed to admit that we don't actually even know how fast the universe is expanding we're arguing about this a lot um it's called the h naught tension h naught being the uh, rate of expansion of the universe today so the the controversy in in uh, brief is that we look at the cosmic microwave background right and we are able to use our model of the universe to extract what the value of h naught should be and then we look at um, stars in our uh, galaxy and we look at the light that is coming from uh, from it and we study it and uh, we see we find a value of h naught from looking studying this light and these two values don't agree but the question is are the astronomers wrong are they making weird observations of the stars are we wrong in our model did something happen between the surface of last scatter and now some new physics that we're not aware of it's it's not clear and we and today actually at 4 p.m there is a new uh, a result around the astronomical observations that i'm very interested in but actually makes the problem worse so even observationally we don't have enough information on the theory side when we try to write down a scalar field theory remember i talked about the scalar fields mm -hmm. we end up with a magnitude of dark energy that is 10 to the power of 120 orders off so we're really off so um it's a big problem thank you no worries what's the difference between the big crunch and the big bounce and why do you think the big bounce is more better a big crunch you don't recover from it you contract you collapse into a singularity and i hate singularities and that wasn't clear um a big bounce essentially you are able to re-expand from it you avoid a singularity you end you remain at a finite size but this comes at the cost of introducing new physics which i hope to find signatures in of in our present day universe um excuse me um you know how you said that when the big bang um well the big bang first happened um the temperature of the particles was like 3000 k kelvins and now the particles that you found are a lot cooler at 3 kelvins is that right or not really so um 3000 kelvin that temperature was at the surface of last scatter this was about 300000 years after the event that was the big bang but yes since that time 300000 years to 14 billion years there has been significant cooling mm -hmm. so how how if our if the like universe is expanding and everything's getting a lot further away how will the universe like end in the heat like thing that you were talking about if they're getting cool i don't know do you know what does that make sense um sort of so i think when i say heat death i just mean that there will be no energy left to i don't know run your coffee machine or yeah. uh, or drive a car because all of the energy that we are able to use for that will be converted into um entropy so that's what I mean by heat death. There will be no interactions or processes to support anything. Formation of stars, life, your coffee machine, nothing. Wow, okay. Yeah. More questions about any part of the talk? This is an open floor. Happy to chat about questions on how does one become a cosmologist as well? I mean, Huge expectations. I expect all of you to study cosmology. I'm kidding. It's fine. Do what you like. <laughs> there was a question at the beginning in, in the chat that uh, asked something more, more general about uh, what, what, what do you do on, um, uh, on a daily basis as part of the daily basis as part of your job. Okay. Yeah, I'm happy to talk about that. So I kind of was trying to touch on that for the model building, but I guess the the actual mechanics of it comes up to be I sit at my desk and I look at equations like the one that you're seeing but um, a little bit tweaked and I try to solve these equations um, in different scenarios and then I find the results and I see how it matches with the observations that my observer colleagues give me and then I write a paper about it and then um, I talk to colleagues about this paper or I go to conferences and then we try to figure out another aspect of the history of the universe 
that we might not know about. And then we sort of make incremental changes. So the questions that I'm telling you, like how did the universe begin? Why is the universe the same in all directions? These are really big general questions. And it's really hard to answer those big general questions. So what we do is that we sort of break these questions into small chunks as like a specific problem. So um, a problem that I've recently solved is um, if the universe, if you can imagine all possible geometries of the universe that are different in different directions, introducing a viscous effect, viscous effect like you know, viscous viscosity as in honey and so on, honey is a viscous fluid. Can you end up with a scenario where the universe looks the same in all directions today? So it's like a really specific question that I'm able to solve, but it kind of contributes to the answer, why does the universe look the same in whichever direction today? Um. <laughs> oh goodness. <laughs> uh, but if um, the universe has just been contracting and expanding, and it's just continuously basically just getting bigger and smaller, and let's say it's eternal, wouldn't heat death have come a long time ago since eventually the energy would have run out in a closed system? So, uh, great question. Um, I didn't say that the universe has always been cycling like this. There is a school of thought that says that the universe is cycling. Um, personally, and this is a philosophical standpoint, so feel free to fight me on this. I don't try to think of parts of the history of the universe that I cannot access causally. What do I mean by that? Causal uh, access means that anything that I cannot get information from, and information travels the fastest possible at the speed of light. So what you're talking about, like prior phases of expansion and contraction of the universe, would be out of that causal reach. And I could, exp I could not see any experimental or observational verifications of those prior phases. So for me, um, as a physicist, um, I find that not something that I can make progress on. So as a physicist and a pragmatist, I tend to not worry about it. Um, in terms of whether there would be a heat death, should we try to like philosophize a little bit and think about cycles? The idea is that if the universe was cycling, then um, the heat death would not have occurred because the universe would not have gotten big enough for all interactions to cease. However, there is an, a related problem that was pointed out by Tolman in the 20s, that if you have a cycling model, then if entropy is increasing, which it is by the second law, then the size of this each consecutive cycle will get bigger and bigger. So the problem is that you will, you will be at a particular cycle with a, a particular size. By size, I mean the maximum size the universe can reach. But then if you're in the cycle, you should be able to technically extrapolate backwards until you get to a cycle of vanishing size. So you end up back with the singularity problem, which is not good, which is exactly what we wanted to avoid with this bouncing model. Um, a way that some cyclic bouncing models try to circumvent the problem is that they say that each bounce is elastic. So, there is, so the entropy does not increase per bounce and there is no memory of previous bounces in the current bounce that you are in. But as I say, I think it's impossible to know because you can't get any causal information from it. So, yeah. uh, thank you. Yeah, thanks, uh, Chandra. If, if you don't mind me chipping in, um, I'm a, an applied mathematician uh, as well, though in a uh, different area. One problem I have with some of the um, what cosmologists and uh, theoretical physicists do is, of course, when you um, when you put forward a theory, and we, we all mathematicians want to put forward theories that are sort of uh, universal, that unify things so that you can write nice equations about it. But uh, as an applied mathematician, you want something that describes the world, so that has some physics attached to it. And the fundamental of physics is experimentation. So you put forward the model, which is maths, and then you do some experiment to, to prove that the model applies, that the things you're saying are, are reproducible. That is a problem in cosmology, isn't it? 
And I agree. Uh, so and people put forward theory and then they say they can't, they can't be substantiated. You, you can't find it's not causal, like you said, or, or whatever, which is sort of amounts to the same thing. And it's, um, it, that is the difficulty I have with uh, uh, string theory, for example. Yeah, I, I agree with what you're saying. I think that is a problem, but I should insert a small caveat here. And this has kind of been the driving force behind string theory. Um, in, if we look at the history of physics, sometimes people have come up with theories that are mathematically consistent with observations that could not have been substantiated at that particular moment in time, but have been predicted, have, have uh, introduced a predictive model that people have, wouldn't have thought to look for if that theory hadn't been written in a mathematically consistent way. Um, the Higgs field is actually such an example. Um, before that, uh, Dirac, I think, is my favorite example because um, he rewrote relativistic quantum mechanics and laid the foundations of quantum field theory. And therefore, out of the theory, because it was mathematically consistent, popped out a natural conclusion that an antiparticle for antiparticles for particles must exist. So therefore, the antiparticle for an electron is a positron. And as we know, positrons, since they've been discovered, have huge applications today, positron emission tomography, so on and so forth. Um, I will also say that this does not give us a free pass, which is why I'm trying to be responsible with the work that I do, that I am trying to find, make contact with observations. This ties into what I was saying in the beginning of the talk, that we're not, we, I don't want to be elitist. I don't want to sit in an ivory tower of mathematics. Um, and I want to make contact with physics and ultimately remember to describe the real world. Yes, thanks. And uh, maybe you can actually say what signatures could possibly prove the, that theory? Or... Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, there are a lot of such signatures. So, for example, we are looking for something called features in the cosmic microwave background. Um, these features uh, would be, these features as particular patterns in like the distribution of temperature of these photons follow a statistical distribution that is called the Gaussian distribution. So any deviations from this Gaussian distribution is what will give us clues of uh, what new, new physics could have occurred. We can parameterize these non-Gaussianities. And this is what I mean by features. So um, whether the universe evolved monotonically, that is, it was always expanding, or there was a different kind of evolution, will affect what these non-Gaussianities are. And these non-Gaussianities, of course, you can find in cosmic microwave background as well as large scale structure. Um, there is another signature that I'm particularly excited about that is of intergalactic magnetic fields. So intergalactic magnetic fields may or may not have been observed in, uh, in things like fast gamma ray bursts or things like blazer. So when you look at a particular kind of star, which is called a pulsar, you find that the radiation is kind of deflected a little bit. And the reason for this could be a magnetic field that exists all across galaxies. That's why it's called intergalactic. Now, creating these magnetic fields in the early universe for a universe that has forever expanded requires a lot of effort in the sense that you have to put in a lot of arbitrary ingredients. And I'm not saying that's bad, but, I, but in a contracting universe, it's much easier to make uh, these magnetic fields arise rather naturally. And the other thing that I am very excited about, as was every astronomer ever, is uh, the signature of gravitational waves. I, I have proposed a model which includes these uh, shear viscous stresses that I was talking about briefly, that will give a very specific signature of the stochastic background of gravitational waves that I hope future gravitational wave experiments will be able to detect. And um, it's a very specific signature, so I'm hoping that we'll be able to say straight out whether this model works or it doesn't. I got a question. Go for it. When you apply your equations to do your experiments, I'm going to assume that you need to use simulators so you can view the data. How do you overcome the limitations of simulators and the inaccuracies of them? Um, so there are two separate questions here. Um, in terms of, there are three branches of cosmology, I would say. There is um, the observational branch, which looks, which takes in large data, processes all this data, and puts out results. 
there are people who do only simulations of how the universe would have evolved, that they, how large scale structure would have been created under um, the laws of physics as we know it. And there are the theorists like me who try to build the actual models and the laws that would be that that the simulate that the people who do simulations use to create this model. So overcoming the limits of the simulations is something that people work on. For example, I talked about the dark energy problem, right? Um, the dark energy problem uh, is that the universe is expanding in an accelerated way. And one of the models that people have said is that there is this mysterious component of dark energy. However, look at the equation that is on the slide right now. It is, it, it, I said, was 12 coupled differential equations. If there are 12 coupled differential equations and matter and gravity are kind of linked, then what matter does is going to affect geometry, and what geometry does is going to affect matter. So the effects that we are talking about are not just linear. They are higher order effects. And some of them, and the higher order effects, are not necessarily small enough for us to ignore. But the simulations that are present right now kind of ignore these higher order effects because they're too hard. So a big push right now in the simulation community is to come up with a way of describing the distribution of galaxies in the computer using full general relativity so that we can take into account all of these effects. And the idea and the reason I brought up dark energy is there is a big proposal that there is no such thing as dark energy. But the reason we see this expansion is because we haven't included these effects and these structures are actually what we call back reacting on the geometry of the universe to give rise to these dynamics. So how do we overcome the uh, problems with simulations? It's an incremental process as with anything else. You just use a quantum computer. I don't have a quantum computer, but um, if mm -hmm. I did, I would love to use one. Uh, we use supercomputers though, they're pretty cool. All right, yes, quantum computer would make it much quicker. <laughs> All right, um, I'm sorry to stop things there, but we are well over time, actually. Just one question. Okay, one more question is... If energy cannot be created or destroyed, but it exists, it must have been created. What do you think about that? Well, I mean, the universe is expanding in an accelerated way, right? Where's that energy coming from? I don't know. That's a, that's a definite violation of that conservation of energy principle that we're talking about. So um, I think the problem is more uh, involved than that. We actually, in cosmology, we talk about conservation of entropy because energy is definitely not being conserved. But that in itself is an assumption. And I would say that is an assumption that is true for only the particular cycle or the framework of the universe that we're observing right now. Also, also I should uh, uh, add that defining gravitational entropy is a whole other can of worms. It's easy to do it for black holes because there is a the there's a theorem that uh, Stephen Hawking and collaborators uh, put forward. But doing it for the universe is really hard because we don't know if the universe is infinite or if it has got a specific boundary and how we can define that boundary and how we characterize entropy. If we had a boundary, it would be much. If we knew for a fact that the universe had a boundary, our lives would be much easier in characterizing this entropy. <laughs>